evening, everyone. It's evening where I am. I'm talking to you from Trinidad. And who am I? This is Corinne Lafon, your moderator for this evening. Good evening, good night, good morning, wherever you are in the world, to all our guests. Again, my name is Corinne, and it is my pleasure to greet you. TCI is a full service provider of expat education and transition services. We exist to educate expats about their options and to support them during every step of their transition. We allow customers to embrace their dream of living abroad while also addressing the realities of being an expat. This is an approach we call optimistic realism. Our objective is to assist all aspiring expats in moving abroad and to create a network of like-minded people to share the experience and excitement of expats everywhere. Our organization is regionally unspecific, so we can help expats no matter what country or city interests them. We begin tonight's event, the TCI Expat Live Series, Where Do You Start? with none other than Leslie Suleiman. We are very excited to have each one of you join us tonight, as well as our guest on the line who is being interviewed. If you haven't already done so, please open your note-taking app or grab a pen and paper to capture your thoughts, questions, and ideas as we spend the next 55 minutes together. During this session, microphones will be placed on mute you will have opportunities to ask questions, at which time we will unmute you. And if you are using a webcam, please feel free to show your webcam. This session is being recorded and will be archived to access via membership. About our host for this evening, Daryl Fort. He is a serial entrepreneur and an experienced professional with a wealth of knowledge in domestic and international business. His background includes extensive travel while working with a Fortune 500 company in his domestic and international operations and the big four accounting firms as an auditor. He has since run a successful business as an entrepreneur for over 15 years. Born and raised in the Canal Zone, Panama, Daryl is the founder and CEO of Transition Concierge International, also known as TCI. He has visited and now worked in over 24 countries, living in two of them, Puerto Rico and Ecuador, as an expat. Without further ado, let's welcome our host, Daryl Fort. Daryl? Hello all, thank you so very much Corinne for the introduction. Welcome to another installment of our TCI Expat Series, Where Do You Start? And as you know, the importance of this series is to introduce you, the attendees, to the different members of our Expat Alliance. All these members of the Alliance are successful expats with a desire to share their life experiences with you so that you, as prepats, aspiring expats, could perhaps glean some information from them and help you on the road from just thinking about maybe somehow one day becoming an expat to actually doing something about it and joining us on this ex amazing adventure that, that is expatriation. Today, we are interviewing Leslie Sullivan. Leslie is a holistic expat. She has throughout her life interwoven her work life and her family life. She has been a writer, an editor, a proofreader, tour guide, and even a wannabe lavender farmer. We'll explore that in a minute. She studied and practiced diverse forms of alternative healing, creating all sorts of different concoctions from her gardens, and then finally getting certified in a number of different modalities. Her healthy children attest to her success, and um, she is very much in love with what she does and actually would prefer so helping people and working with them than even doing it as a business. So without further ado... I'd like to introduce all to Leslie Suleiman. Leslie, how are you? I'm just fine tonight. How are you doing up there in Tampa? Yes, I am Tampa today, traveling, and <laughs> things are good. Things are good. The, uh, the hurricane that swung by uh, could have been much worse in this area particularly. Good, good. Um, before we get started, that, that brings me to uh, the fact that I would like to extend heartfelt sympathy to all those affected by the recent disasters from the fires in the western U.S. and, the, of course, the hurricanes in the U.S. and Caribbean and the earthquake, and that's just the western hemisphere. Things have been going on. It's been a very active few months, and so I, I just want to extend my heartfelt sympathies to all those who have been affected by this. That is very gracious, Leslie, yeah. and it is very true. And on behalf of TCI, we do the same. It is, it has been a tough situation. But as we get into our series, um, we're looking forward to talking to you, learning a little bit about your life. And before we get into our questions, Leslie, 
Talk to us a little bit about being a wannabe lavender farmer. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I've I've used essential oils as I as I've written about in this in for TCI. I've used essential oils probably for 30 years. And my favorite, my all-time favorite is lavender. And when I moved, I moved from North Carolina, which has a pretty benign climate where they say you stick a crutch in the ground and it sprouts, to Colorado, where it was a little more challenging. And I found that living in Durango, that lavender grew really well. I wanted to have some sort of major league garden, and I wanted to do lavender oils, and I went up to the Northwest to to go to a lavender festival, and I did all kinds of research. I still haven't gotten to France for their lavender fields, but it's quite an amazing plant and essential oil, and I just kind of fell in love with the idea. It was an emotional decision, very definitely. <laughs> well, I think so, it's a great um, story and a wonderful precursor to a great conversation that we're about to have. So, as you know, <laughs> Leslie, in our in this series, we ask all of our guests the same five questions. And, of course, we never have the same kind of conversations. We're looking forward to sharing your life with you a little bit. So let's start with our first question. So, Leslie, what was your main motivation behind your decision to become an expat? And as you answer that, uh, give us some insight as to how much time passed from the first time you thought of you know, becoming an expat to actually doing it. And was it a decision you wish you had made earlier? Okay, so my, my answer is a little different from your other panelists in that um, I, it was, I'm an unexpected expat. I bought property down here about eight or nine years ago as a rental, as an investment in about 2009 uh, when the economy in the, in the United States was pretty sketchy. I wasn't of retirement age at the time, but I was um, anticipating what next for the next 10 or 20 years, and I don't play golf. So I thought, well, you know, learn another language, learn another culture. Um, how, how bad could it be? How much trouble could I get into, you know, wandering around the globe? And I found Ecuador through some other travels, actually. And I invested in this small condo and came down here maybe five or six years ago thinking that I would only be down here for six months. My life morphed a bit, and I thought, okay, I need a break, and I came down here, and it lasted three years. I was down here for three. So I love the term the unexpected expat, right? So you buy this rental property, uh, no intention of moving or living overseas, but, you know, I have a rental property, may as well go and enjoy it, rent it out while you don't have it. Talk to me about life morphing. How did that happen? What happened? What do you mean by that? It means that I, well, I was just approaching, I was just going into a divorce. I had a health challenge at the time. Um, Life was stressful, even though I was pretty much living out in the country in Colorado. So life was, I mean, it's a beautiful place. But I came down with the idea that I just needed to simplify, just regroup. And my kids were both in college or out. They were, I think both had, the younger one had not graduated yet, but that's, that was the phase of life that I was in. So I had the freedom to do something that I'd been wanting to do, and I just did it. I just released, sort of opened my hands and let go right. um, and jumped in. So something happened in this experience during that six months that changed you from, well, let me go six months and you know, regroup and get back to life. To saying, wow, this is life. What were some of those experiences that you could perhaps share with us that made you say, let, let me stay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One, well, it was sweet. It's a lifestyle that can be really sweet. And for me, it was very much simpler. Not everybody has that experience and looking around their people in different phases of their life that are still chasing their tails or they bring things down here that complicate their lives. But for me, it was, um, 
I don't know, walking, I'm in a small town. So I walk everywhere. I walk to the market when I want to buy veggies. You know, it's an indigenous market or Ecuadorian mestizo market. Fresh food all over the place, meeting, running into people that you know. Just it, it, a very warm culture, which I think we have kind of gotten away from in the United States. People, you say, when I'm, I did end up going back for a couple of years, and I noticed that if I, I said hello to someone, and I, at, at first I was doing that all the time because that's just the way of it down here, but I would say hello to someone, and they'd look at me like I wanted something from them. <laughs> it was, we've really gotten away from that for the most part up in uh, the United States. And so I got used to that down here. I got used to being kind of embraced. So it, in that six months, I got very comfortable. And also it, the added factor of um, not having to have air conditioning or heat is lovely. That's really wonderful. So, right. That's interesting. Yeah. So you are unexpected, very different than most who think about expatriation. Some catalyst gets them going and, you know, they, and they plan it and they kind of go ahead you kind of fell into it. Do you think that if you, from your own personal experience, had gone the typical route and weren't the unexpected expat, but perhaps the expected expat, do you think that you would have done it uh, the same way, had the same kind of uh, experiences, or do you think it would have been a more of a challenge for you? Well, something I would caution for people going forward is to be sure that they're going towards something rather than trying to escape something or go away from something that they don't like, that they're going towards an adventure. Yeah, rather than feeling so uncomfortable in something that they make that change. It was very gentle for me. Because I had been here a number of times, I had a fair idea of what I was getting into. I knew people. I knew people in the town. I knew where things were. I don't know. I No, I would not have had the same experience. And I would suggest also for people who are considering this, and if they can, to rent for six months or so to get their sea legs, kind of, wherever they're going. And if they can't do that, to be sure that they make several trips to the town that they're interested in, and also to make contacts, to make at least friendly acquaintances, so that they don't, it doesn't feel completely alien to them. Also, speaking of alien, to start, if there's a different language involved and they are not familiar with it, to at least start to take classes in that and make sure that they are committed enough to do that because it makes a world of difference. Right. You know, one of the things, if you watch some of these shows they have on TV, House Hunters International and uh, Living Abroad and different kind of things, <coughs> there's a general theme, right? One of those general themes is simplification, getting out the rat race. You eased out the rat race, right? And you were able to live a simpler life, <coughs> as a result of unexpectedly kind of falling into that, saying, wow, that's a difference. Did it surprise you that this ability to simplify was so easy than most think? It has surprised me. I think something that has taken me some time to understand that there's a difference between feeling like you may be spinning your wheels and feeling really present with something. Because when you start to simplify, you can start to feel sort of uncomfortable because you you kind of don't know what's next. You know, as if you're supposed to be, we have this, we have this process in the United States, I I think, and, may, and I'm sure it's not just there. I see it here as well. But you, you, feeling productive, we all have to feel productive all the time. And in order to be that, we feel that we have to chase our tails. Something has to be happening all the time. So I think it's easy for people to feel that they're spinning their wheels when really they are just simply being really present 
with what's happening right now. And that's a, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one, I think. You know, that's actually a really insightful comment about being productive, being busy, right? Mm-hmm. I've had people that I know personally who had a ch- who had, are retired, but still had a challenge in their minds doing dinner and a movie on a Wednesday because it was Wednesday. And you don't do dinner and a movie on a Wednesday. You do that mm-hmm. on Friday or Saturday. And they're retired. <laughs> but they just <laughs> were in the wheel still, still in the cog. And, and it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and speaking of people, so no one's an island. So you have friends, family, people that love you. And here you are living abroad. Did you experience any opposition from them? Uh, as you made this decision? (laughs) Well, I sort of snuck up on them. I was pretty sneaky about it because I was down here, oh, I guess probably about four months, five months, and I decided I wanted wanted to stay longer. But in order to do that, I had to get my residency visa, which was based on my investment. And again, in in order to do that, it took two years. It was a two-year commitment. And I wanted, in in doing that, I wanted to have the flexibility and freedom to be able to come and go. Nobody really gave me much of a hassle with that. The only deal uh, that came along with that is that my my daughter was decided she was going to have a child right around in that time. (laughs) So that became a magnet for me, you know, going back and forth a bit. And it also drew me back to the United States to live for about two and a half years. I now have two grandchildren up there. Um, and they're, they're certainly not ready for college. <laughs> <Once, laughs> when, to when to start a kindergarten. But, so that's definitely a draw and will continue to be. Sure. But I, I am not getting, I'm not getting a lot of flack from anybody. No, they know. They've been down here. They will, can, they will come down here. My son's coming down in November. So it'll, it'll a lot of back and forth. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Because once again, unexpected expat, so it unexpectedly hit you. But as a result, it unexpectedly hit them. And so there's a process that the expected expat goes through that you kind of went through vicariously. And as a result of that, didn't have perhaps some of the same reactions. So let's talk about that for a little bit for the benefit of our attendees. So let's go back in time for a minute and let's, and let's imagine that you are not the unexpected expat. You are the expected expat and you've decided to move overseas and you're going to Ecuador and your family has never been down there and they don't know what the situation is with safety and life and all the kind of things. How do you think they would react to it? <laughs> First up, I would make sure that everybody has a passport. I would try to make sure that I, I had done my research, that other people knew what I was getting into. And frankly, I didn't start this adventure until my parents had already passed away. My parents were older and my mom was not in good shape a few years before I did this. I would have been much more reluctant to venture. I think I do have friends who have done this, even though they have older parents and they have kids who, I have friends who, who have kids who won't talk to them because they've made this decision. And I have other younger friends whose family's parents are, are really on the fence about it. So you can confront all kinds of things, but I think it, I don't know, I guess it depends on how close you are to, to your family and how open they are to new adventures for themselves and for you. It's a challenge. It's definitely yeah. a challenge all the way around for that, I, and I can't imagine. Now, you used an interesting word, and the word was open, right? Tell us about the process of your children and your family, their exposure to, over those six months and, not, and beyond, to where you're living, what you were doing, and how all this unexpectedly crept up on them. <laughs> the realization that, you know what, this is okay for mom. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, they, they went to schools where they traveled. My daughter has been a lot more places than I have been. She was in Argentina for a year. She's been to Africa with a school group. She was in, gosh, she's been to Italy twice for two months each, which I'm just still jealous about. Uh, my son has traveled internationally a lot. So they weren't as concerned as some might be for that. And as I said, they have, they've come down here. They were here when I decided to uh, make the leap and buy this place. They saw it. They saw it unfinished. So they, they're pretty sophisticated when it comes to that. I don't know that they're entirely surprised because I encourage them to do it so much. And it's basically now my turn you know, to do this sort of thing. Right. You know, as, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of, you know, within TCI, we have three E's of success. And the company is actually kind of designed around those E's. And the first one is expose. It's exposure. Your kids mm-hmm. saw it. You saw it. And mm-hmm. so the mystery of, uh, is it safe? Is it this? Is it that? You know, was gone because... They had seen in their own travels, obviously traveling with you and seeing things. That's really interesting. And I think however people gain that exposure, whether it's through an exploratory trip or involving their family as much as possible in the decision, mm-hmm. in the process, to help disband in their minds, right? Whatever misconceptions they may have. You know, those, those are all positive things. Mm-hmm. All positive mm-hmm. things. I think it's really good. I would, I- I would also say and encourage and always did with my kids, but I think also with friends, family, whomever you're going to be talking to about this is a sense of endless curiosity. If you look at the United States, there's only a small percentage of people who even have passports. We are not encouraged to expand in terms of language A lot of schools don't have language programs. Right now, we're not as embracing as we might be of different cultures. So we can get very isolated. So I have encouraged, I've encouraged my kids to be really curious about what's next, who that next person is, where are they from, what's interesting, what other cultures are about. It's a life lesson. It's a... Life path, I think. Yeah, it's so true. But I I think Americans have a challenge. 3,000 miles from sea to shining sea, North Carolina to California, there's the same language, essentially the same culture. And, you know, Walmart and TJ Maxx and Marshall. It's all, it's, you know, you don't have to. But if you go to Germany, you know, 300 miles in one direction is France. 200 miles in the other direction is Switzerland. And completely different cultures, different languages, different, uh, well, until recently, different m- monies. Uh, I mean, you know, so y- you almost have to. There's, there's, there's no way to avoid it in many of these European countries because you border two or three other countries. Right. So we have to create the interests uh, sometimes in our country. We simply just don't have the exposure. And you seem to have done a very good job of that with your kids. I hope so. I hope so. We worked on it. My mom was a very good example. She was in China in 1937. That was before Mao was really Mao. Yeah. <laughs> she, was, she was there for a, um, her junior year abroad, and Chiang Kai-shek was still in the mountains. And she always talked about that. So, yeah, I, kudos to my mother. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. So, you're the unexpected expat, and so this next question is designed for the expected expat, someone who's thinking about it, and it's a question about criteria and connections. And so the idea behind criteria, and the question is, what were your criteria, right? What were the things that you were looking for in a place to go? That's the, typically the first question. And then the second question is about connection. So... You can have a list of five to ten criteria, things that you're looking for in a place to live. And those ten things could fit in 20 different cities and 20 different countries and all around the world, right? Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. you're going to connect with that place. Have that 
place where you say, wow, it has all the criteria, but I feel comfortable. I feel at home here. So you, once again, stumble into all this, right? <laughs> Successfully, the first <laughs> shot out. So right. as a result of that, of those first six months, what did you discover were the things, the criteria that were important to you in a move abroad, in a new country, new city? Well, the climate is really benign. I felt in the first six months, I felt you could probably grow anything any time of year, which I love. You know, I've, I've been an avid gardener most of my adult life or all my adult life. And I thought that was amazing. I thought it was amazing. I'm at 80, eight, well, I'm about 8,000 feet. I'm at about 8,000 feet in the Andes. And there are palm trees growing in the plaza here in the Andes. <laughs> and I, things grow that I only barely recognize because they're so much bigger than I expect them to be. Those, the, it, there's a fascination there's a, I, I didn't expect that exactly. I, I, I kind of fell in love with that, but I didn't really expect that. I didn't expect it to feel so sweet to be able to walk everywhere. And that the culture was different enough. We, we're several cultures, and, and now there are so many cultures, so many languages spoken here. It's always interesting. But I, I didn't expect to be drawn in quite so much by the cultures. I still don't understand them. I don't understand the indigenous culture. I speak enough Spanish to be able to communicate. I don't speak Quechua, but I am intrigued by it. I like that, I, you know, that unlimited curiosity, that thing that I carry around with me. The, you know, it's, I love that there are children in the street all the time. Sometimes really in the street, which is <laughs> always great. Exactly. But it's just, it's a family, it's a family affair. There are people and kids all ages, all kinds of people. I love it. I, I absolutely love that. And I didn't, I didn't know that I, how much I needed that right. within the simplicity. It's a really simple kind of way of living. It's a different rhythm. It's a different rhythm of life. Yeah. Lots of expats. I think pretty much everyone we've interviewed on this series have expressed the reality of wanting and realizing their appreciation for what you mentioned, the walkability of a place. Mm -hmm. what is, what's up with that? Why is that, do you think that's such a big deal for so many people? Mm. Uh, for me, one of the things is that it's uh, automatic exercise, and you end up feeling really good when you just simply automatically exercise, sort of mandatory exercise. Some people put a lot of stairs in their house for that <laughs> reason. I, that unexpected, you know, we're talking about things that are unexpected. You see people in unexpected ways. You run into things that you are only, it's almost like a video when you're in a car all the time and you pass things by, you don't see, smell things and run into things the same way. Certainly, we hope not the same way. But people, you run into people that you know, you get to have conversations on the street corners, you pick things up maybe that you wouldn't necessarily, you know, shopping. It's just very much more casual, I guess than from a point A to point B in a car. Right. Were things like medical and things like that important to you? No, I'm, uh, because I do all my alternative stuff, I pretty much expected to be able to do that down here, either for myself or that there would be services down here. It, it has expanded a lot here. Right. Uh, a lot of things have changed. It has grown. My Spanish is a whole lot better, so I, I know what I'm getting into a bit more. I, as a matter of fact, there's, there is medical tourism down here. People are coming down here for medical, allopathic medical treatments right. that uh, either are too expensive or are even unavailable in the United States. Right. So, so one of my challenges as I talk about this 
concept of criteria is a realization that you ask a person, you ask the expected expat, the person who is planning on being an expat, right? Mm-hmm. What the criteria are, and they give you a list, right? And it'll tell you walkability and medical, and there are a few things that like you're kind of everybody is interested in, and then the, the, the other things that maybe that person's an outdoors person, so they want more outdoors and that kind of thing. Right. But then that first list is almost a uh, what I think I want list. <laughs> then they oh, get yeah. in the country and they find out that either some things on the list really weren't that important. Or the other things on the list that weren't, weren't on the list that, were, that they should have been on the list. So in your case, tell me what surprised you. So there were some things, obviously, you said, okay, well, that was on my list and I'm experiencing it, so great. But what surprised you? Things you thought that weren't going to be important to you that ended up being extremely important to you as far as your criteria were concerned? Hmm. I mean, the things that I discovered here that sort of tripped over and were important and I didn't know that they would be. Yeah. I think you mentioned simplicity was also part of that rhythm. You just didn't expect it to be that good. No, I didn't expect it to be. I've been living in the country in Colorado, way, way out. And, And it was, in a lot of ways, it was quite simple, but I was really dependent on my car. No, I, I think I really didn't expect, and I like driving, <laughs> not as much as I did when I was out there. I was driving a lot, just getting into town. But there were a lot of days I just didn't bother to go. I didn't expect to enjoy being kind of in the middle of a beehive, kind of in the middle of a community that unfolded And I walked around and became part of the community. I didn't expect that to be so sweet. I I was surprised by that. I love the word sweet, the way you use it in that term. (laughs) It is really (laughs) really nice. I appreciate that sentiment to add to that. You bought a house there. A condo. A a condo. It's just a perch. It's a perch. Uh, You bought a perch, which you bought, right? So... Lots of people rent, and as a result of buying, this gives you an exposure to legal and government processes that perhaps other people don't have. So let me wrap that conversation in with the next question, which is, what did you wish you knew when you made the move? Okay, so when I bought the property, it was really pretty cut and dried, very clear for the most part, even though I probably should have had a translator and I didn't, but it was, it was with a developer that was well known, et cetera, et cetera. In getting my visa, I think that is, uh, can be the tripping point in that you really need to have good legal advice. This goes for anywhere. This goes in the United States also, but you should have a good translator. You should have, even if you speak Spanish, unless you're entirely fluent like you are, You should have all your ducks in a row for that because you can trip up on things and your attorney can too. And you don't know when that's happening. Right. So good legal advice and get, uh, get several uh, suggestions for an attorney or, and then you know what else? That's also true with uh, medical tourism. If you're coming down here for something like that, any kind of medical, and if you live here, any kind of medical attention, you need to, you need to find somebody who's really, you, you need to get a lot of the word I'm coming up with is suggestions, but, you know. Right. Yeah. You know, and there's some practices here, I, I can tell you from my own experience that there are just things you just don't think about in the States, right? So, you know, I was opening a bank account, and so I, right. they, told, they told me, oh, you got to make sure your signature matches your passport. Like, what do you mean? I mean, I just signed, mm-hmm. right? I mean, and, yeah. and, and, you know, you realize that over the years, your signature, your signature changes, right? Right. Certainly, uh, back in the day when I had my, my, other, my, my other company, another company, and I was signing checks, believe me, my, my signature went from being kind of long to really short. And, you know, you sign mm-hmm. 50 checks, right? You just kind of mm-hmm. get your little mm-hmm. Zorro scribble on and, and, and it's done. Well, I signed the bank documents, 
They sent it off to Guayaquil for verification. It came back. Oh, signature doesn't match his passport. I actually had to <laughs> practice in the banker's office. Oh my gosh! My signature to get it to match my passport signature. I had signed like ten years before. Oh my gosh! You had to forge your own signature. I, I mean, who, who would have thought of that <laughs> as an issue? Did you run into right. this kind of stuff? You know, you know, I mean, well, you're property. You run into, do you run into things like that, that from a U.S. perspective, or even a, a legal or governmental perspective, just wouldn't have thought of, but it yes. might be an issue there? Yes, yes. Especially when you consider how blasé they are about some things. They're very, very, the bureaucracy is extremely particular about others. And I have a good friend who was divorced, oh my gosh, 30 years ago. And that is a complication in Ecuadorian law. They do not like to see someone who is divorced. So a lot of people just say they're single, even though they have, if, if they've maybe didn't been divorced for 10 or more years. Anyway, this friend of mine had been divorced all that long and she had some sort of document that she had to, for which she had to present her divorce papers and her attorney in the United States had misspelled her name by one letter and it threw everything awry. Everybody was in a tizzy. She had to call or contact her attorney, thank God he was still alive, and get the thing changed so that it could go through in Ecuador. I've heard of a few people who, who have had similar situations that um, really are just kind of a little bit crazy. Yeah. And, and make you really want to keep it as simple as you possibly can. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, uh, and, you, you know, in your case is Ecuador, but I, I can tell you people I've talked to in France and China and other places where I have friends of expats, they're, you know, it's it's different experience. And you just have to be meticulous on those kinds right. of things. right. But the thing is, you sometimes you don't know where you're supposed to be meticulous. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> it can get really crazy because you, things you, you've, t- you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's until your eyes are crossed, and um, you, you still don't have it. You still don't, it still doesn't, yeah. Anyway, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. Language. You had made a comment earlier about maybe doing a little something something about beefing your language skills up before you move to a, another country. How important do you think that is? That is very important. I think it's extremely important. When you consider how we are in the United States, how important it is for people to know some English or be learning English, and how offended some people get, it is a courtesy. Uh, aside from all the practicalities, it's a courtesy, especially if it's your new adopted country, to learn some Spanish. On top of which, it's a whole lot easier. You know, talking to a bus driver or talking to a taxi driver or your waitress or your next door neighbor, the person at the market. It's, uh, you can be a lot friendlier. You can be um, included more. You learn things that you might not have learned otherwise about your community. I think it's hugely important, as well as being common courtesy. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's very much so. Any, any surprises from you from a culinary perspective? Availabilities <laughs> of foods and types of foods? Any, any, any eye-openers you'd like to share with us? Well, something that a lot of people comment on when they first come down here is, gee whiz, uh, the the cuisine is nothing like Mexico. People expect because it's it's on the equator. (laughs) You're laughing. (laughs) Well, it's it's not Mexico. (laughs) Well, it's, uh, you know, they expect it to be really hot. Right. I still have I still have family uh, who who will say, "Wow, I bet it's really hot there right now." It's like, no, it's six like sixty five, and they don't, you know, it's I don't get it. I don't get it. It's you know, this is where alpaca comes from, for heaven's sakes. Besides Peru, right? You know, uh, it has been really interesting when I, you know, being a gardener, 
and thinking that everything grows here. Because it's a benign climate, I just thought, oh gosh, you can grow really just about anything. But it is different in that the hot, spicy things don't grow, maybe more so on the coast. They grow better on the coast because it's a hotter climate down there. But here up in the Andes, things are pretty mild. And the herbs and spices that grow, there aren't a lot of spices actually that grow here, but um, the herbs that grow are generally pretty, pretty bland. Uh, there are only, now I say only, but 12 hours of sun year round, which means that we don't get the many hours of sun that the northern climates get in the summer. So you, you don't get that stressed, you know, you, we can't grow really good tomatoes up here unless it's in a greenhouse. So uh, the strong, strong flavors, frankly, actually, I bring stuff in. (laughs) The things things that I really like, I'm a tea drinker. And the tea, I have a good Ecuadorian friend who comes over for tea. And I will give her an Ecuadorian tea bag and she'll dip it in her hot water twice. And that's what she wants. And then I'll say, okay, would you like some sugar? Oh, yeah, just a little. And she'll put five tablespoons in. And this is... (laughs) Pretty typical. I have found this to be pretty typical. They're Mm. not strong flavors. So if you like strong tea, if you like strong spices, you actually do need to bring them. Good good, uh, (laughs) counsel there. Good soup, though. Great soup here. Excellent soup. Oh, that's (laughs) true. Yeah. Well, in in the mountains, it's it's a a soup culture, very much so. The more so. So you're... You're the, unex- you're the unexpected expat. You <laughs> came down to your, your rental property to get away, to regroup, you know, with every intention of, you know, going back and getting back at it. During that time frame, life morphed, and you started discovering things. And, it, and admitting to yourself things about your life, time of life, situation you're in. But then at some point in time, in that, time frame you had to do what everyone else does and says okay yeah i am going to be an expat tell us about Mm. that moment when you knew made the decision (laughs) right i'm not going back this is it i'm gonna do what i need to do to make this my new home but that's that what was there was there some aha moment was there some uh, what was it that moment when you said, I'm done, this is it, I'm changing my life? Mm, interesting. That's interesting. That's an interesting question. I think you'd probably have to nail my shoes to the floor uh, for me to, to make that kind of commitment and say, aha, this is it. I don't know. I mean, I'm an expat right now. I don't anticipate living in the, back in the United States in the near future. But, you know, as, my, as I said, my, my daughter had children. I, le- <laughs> I went back. As long as things are fascinating to me, I have no reason not to be doing what I'm doing. Right. I, and I don't think, and this, this is also something, you know, for people who do bring down all their stuff in a, in a container, you know, they decide I'm bringing all my five dogs and my five children and this is the deal. This is what we're doing. Then they stay five years. That's still a real success. That's still really having done it, you know, really making an interesting change and being pretty clear about it. I don't think you should feel one way or another if you change your mind midstream. I think that's what life's about Yeah. For me anyway. No, that's, that's a really beautiful insight. Um, one of the things that uh, has come up in other interviews is people end up being serial expats, right? They, so they come to <laughs> a place. Who said that expatriation means you move once to one place and that's that, right? Right. Once they've gotten over the process and they go, wow, that wasn't near as crazy as I thought it would be. How about mm-hmm. Portugal? <laughs> right, right. right. Uh, hey. I have a good friend in Portugal. Yes, she she moved from from uh, Vilcabamba, Ecuador, to Portugal. Yep, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. And even in that space of time, 
oh, let's go back to Virginia, okay? And, oh, right. and after that, oh, Thailand. It's the world, you, you start seeing the world different, not as, you know, these other places, but almost like, as a lack of a better word, like one place, uh, which it, mm-hmm. it is, mm-hmm. uh, with mm-hmm. different places to go. Mm-hmm. So, Leslie, I want to thank you for just a lovely conversation, right? What, thank what you. A, what a kindred spirit. What an interesting life. What, um, and so much more to look forward to uh, as you move forward. Before we wrap things up, I want to talk to you a little bit about your uh, work with us here at TCI. So the TCI Alliance, as you very well know and are a part of, is a collection of people just like yourself with amazingly interesting stories, diverse stories, who write for us and do different things for us, content for us, but with a purpose, right? Um, And our manifesto speaks about paying it forward, a statement of purpose speaks about serving. Um, So tell us a couple of, well, three things. One, What do you want to get out of being a part of the Alliance for yourself? Two, what do you want to give to other people? And three, what do you write for us and why do you write it? Okay. What I get out, this is sort of a a morphing of all, all your three questions. What I get out of it is that I get to talk about fun stuff. (laughs) And what you know, what I'd like to share with other people is the fun stuff I like to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think that I've studied and lived um, with alternative healing for the last thirty years or so. So that just comes out naturally. I almost have to clamp my lips shut in order not to say stuff, you know, like there's an herb for that or have you tried or whatever. So the fact that I get to talk about it and write about it is just awesome for me. And I also, you know, getting to talk about my experience uh, living abroad and the changes that it's made in me. I think that's something that I, I didn't mention is that I've been surprised at how much I've changed And my view of the world has changed. And I hope it's broadened me. You know, I hope it's broadened my horizons. I would like to think so. So I get to share that uh, for people who may be contemplating moving abroad, what they may be surprised by with themselves and in their own path. Um, And what was your third question? Uh, What do you write for us and why do you write it? What's oh, well, I've answered that also. Wow. I write the alternative, <laughs> um, uh, all about alternative healing, and I write it because I can't not, <laughs> because I'm always talking about it. So it's just really fun. It's oh, really fun for me. Leslie, well, this has been a fun conversation. I am grateful for your time, for your spirit, and just uh, a lovely life. Before we go, Thank any you. parting words you'd like to share with our attendees? Uh, Well, what just comes up is go for it. Just go for it. Simplify it. Put it all in storage. Regroup. Go for it. Even if you have five kids, take them all all with you. Put all your stuff in storage. Take, you know, one stuffed animal each and just (laughs) (laughs) do it. That's what I would say. Why not? Exactly. Why not? What can can you not undo? And and that's uh, a, a beautiful thought. So to all uh, who are with us, uh, we just are finishing our conversation with Leslie Suleiman, and um, she is one of our TCI Alliance writers, writes a column on alternative medicine for us, but has also just shared with us an interesting perspective as the unexpected expat. Hopefully in the conversation, you could see some of yourself and perhaps some tips on how you can approach easing into an expat uh, life, not only for yourself, but for the people who you know and love you end up doing so successfully. So I want to thank all for attending and we'll now turn our comments back over to Corinne. Thank you so much, Daryl. What a lovely conversation. I wouldn't even call it an interview. Uh, I love the information that was shared. The whole thing sums up nicely. Like Leslie said, why not? Why not give it a go? And, you know, in listening to her 
people have so many assumptions that they make over certain things that is only when they they actually take the leap of faith and jump into it they realize it's not all that bad i can do this and then once they get their feet wet and they get accustomed to it they try something else again they're looking for a new challenge why not somewhere else why not this other place i absolutely love that and it speaks to how resilient we can be as human beings and um, just make the adjustment when needs be and just take the leap of faith. So I want to thank Leslie so much for being a fantastic guest, being an unexpected expat um, <laughs> and hope that others would become unexpected expats as well or expected expats, transition into an expected expat and um, enjoy the life that is out there for you. I want to also thank Daryl for being such a fantastic host and interviewer. I'm taking the time out to, to do these series of interviews to inform and educate our listening audience from all over the world. So let me just sum up everything. So thanks to everyone who attended the interview today, the session, the series today. Uh, we want to thank you so much and we want to invite you there are three links that i posted there just a few minutes ago inviting you to take advantage of our one dollar trial offer it's just one dollar give it a go why not that link has been posted for you the information will be there once you open the link if you don't get those links or you don't see it in the chat those links will also be sent to you uh, as a follow-up so we have that one dollar trial offer for you as well as inviting you to connect with us on our facebook page as well as to register for future events like these every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. However, when the session ends, an evaluation page will pop up. Please provide your honest feedback. When we know better, we do better. And again, just as a final reminder, check out our $1 offer. Check out and like us and follow us on our Facebook page. And register and tell your friends, family, colleagues, anybody who's thinking, looking for a change. You know, you're just tired of the life. You want something different. You dream of something different. Why not give it a go and register and listen to what others have done and maybe you may be interviewed on this same series one day, sharing your experience with others who would like to try just like you. Thank you again. My name is Corinne Lafond and have a good evening wherever you are. Good night. Good morning. We thank you so much. Have a good evening and we hope to see you and more of persons like yourself on the next session next week. Thank you so much.